Hello everyone, it is time for this week's live stream and we're going to talk about dinoflagellates, topic of the week. I um, have been dealing with this weird dusting in Caitlin's Reef now for a few weeks and it just seemed like diatoms on steroids, but I didn't have any answers. And so last weekend I made the decision based on some help from Michael Campbell, who's actually a viewer of this channel. He said, you need to get this microscope and I just added to cart. <laughs> Six hours later, it was here. So I have it right here to show you guys. Ta-da! This is my hobby grade microscope, AM scope. It's the C1, oh, I'm sorry, the 150C. You can move the optical piece for different angles, which is kind of convenient. You've got three different uh, magnifications and um, it goes from 40X all the way to 1000X. And then there is an additional fitting where you could take out this optical piece and you could put in this one right here, which I believe increases everything 25% even greater. So you really get to zoom in. Now, I will tell you that I haven't used one of these since I was in high school. <laughs> and I'm sure the one I had in high school was better quality than this one. I, um, you know, cause it had to be durable. I had to hold up with kids messing with it every single day. But uh, this one will be fine for in my in-home use. It has a port on the back for electricity. Comes with a nice little power supply. And you can just plug that. Actually, I didn't use it because I used the battery compartment, but it's again USB these days. So you just plug it into the wall and this end would go into the back of the microscope. Not uh, the, yeah, microscope. Now, one thing I did like about this is that I found you could not bring the base up so high that the lens breaks the cover slide, which I felt was something that always happened. <laughs> you would be focusing, you're trying to get figure out what it is and you hear, and you just broke it. And this one doesn't seem to do that. Now, I don't know if that's just an improvement since I used one or if it's um, just well-designed, but I liked that feature. So you've got these different heights. I mean, that's pretty close to the plate. And then you would just bring it up and down to uh, find that sweet spot. And it's pretty easy to use. Down here is a light. And I, because I have batteries in it, you can see the light turn on. And then you can increase the brightness or dim it down on how much you want just with this knob on the side here. So that's what I was doing. I was dimming it down, turning it up. So, I mean, overall, not bad. And this was like $102. So it wasn't like a huge investment. And I've been kind of on the fence about buying one for a long time. And I kept thinking, I want something I can connect to my phone. I want something I can connect to my computer. And uh, this one here does not do any of that. But it allows me to look at what's on the substrate of my sand. And that's what matters most. Uh, basically, you know, it seems like all the ones that are out there that have like a, a screen on them, they don't focus properly. Uh, they make it really hard to identify stuff. They might be, per, you know, kind of a cool thing or a, a, a cool thing for a kid. It's a toy. But, you know, for us scientists, <laughs> us Aquarists, we really want the good quality gear. So I, um, I thought this would be useful for all kinds of things. One of the things that popped into my mind was to look at a grain of carbon because I always hear there's so much surface area. Uh, Jason says you can look at algae. So, I mean, there's all kinds of different things you can look at. You can also zoom in on your pictures and just put your phone under there. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But no. So anyway, I want to show you that. Um, and then I was going to show you what Caitlin's tank looks like. So you can see there's this little bit of brown stuff on the sand. It's not horribly, unbelievably gross. Uh, it's definitely not snotty. Uh, it doesn't have the stringy hairs coming off of it, which is why I was thinking this can't be dinoflagellates. But there are different kinds. And uh, in this case here, we're dealing with a very specific thing called Ostropsis. So uh, I just wanted to show you what it looks like in the tank. And it gets darker throughout the day, and then at night it just fades away, like cyano does. But this wasn't cyano. And when it got on the glass, the glass kind of had this reddish-brownish hue, and I would clean with a cleaning magnet, and it would just turn into dust and go into the water column. It didn't come off in sheets of algae. It did not... Uh, it, it's just weird. I mean, I could literally see the of the smoke into the water. And I thought, how strange is that? So I showed you guys this microscope. There is an attachment that works for Windows desktops and maybe Android phones where you can put this thing in the top of the eyepiece and go ahead and get a look, you know, tethering it with a wire to a laptop and maybe 
might be easier for you to look at that. Um, it's very, very hard to line up your phone, the camera on your phone. Let me switch back for a second. You've got your eyepiece here that was in the microscope. And then you try and take, oh, come on, you. Your phone's coming to life. And then you try to line up the camera on there and it just, oh, it's such a pain. It was really hard. And I sometimes would have to disable the, the macro feature. So it would just turn that camera off and that way it would try to play nice as I tried to film what was going on on the actual slide. Now, uh, it is possible, but it's you know kind of a balancing act. And if you can use two hands, great. If you're trying to hold the phone in place and adjust the focus, I would just get the focus right before you do anything. Um, and then here is an example of the slide. So the way that I got my sample onto the slide was this. I went ahead and I grabbed myself an Elos test kit and I reached down into the tank and I scooped out a little tiny bit of the sand, just, you know, I don't know, 50 grains. I mean, it wasn't much and water was in here. And I put the lid on top, which I never ever use, but I save forever for no reason. And I had a reason finally, and I would shake it. And that would get whatever was on those grains of sand into suspension. And the water got a little, little bit, a little bit cloudy, just a, a fraction. And then with the included pipette that I got with this kit, I bought some other stuff here. I'll show you this. Uh, I don't even know what the stuff is because there was zero instructions. Oh, <laughs> it's on the bottom of the box. <laughs> Maybe I should have looked at that. But uh, so I got this and it is a preparation kit. It says here it has something called Eosin. It's got methylene blue, tweezers, a swab, uh, five blank slides and cover slips and then five prepared slides that I literally do not need. Um, a set of ID stickers. Oh, is that what those are for? A Petri dish, a pick, a stirring rod, a vial, a set of Kim wipes, a pipette, and a microtome. I don't know what the, oh, I think I know what the microtome is. I was wondering what this thing was. So it came with this little guy here that is a circle and there's a knob on here and there's clearly a razor blade, a double-edged razor blade underneath. And as you turn it, it would probably slice something very, very finely and drop it through the hole maybe. I don't know. I don't know how to use that. Um, like I said, there was, I didn't see any instructions. I didn't even know there was a graphic on the back, bottom of that box. But what I did was I used one of their slides and I used one of their cover slips and I used this little tiny pipette, like I said. So here is my little shaken up sample. I reached in with this, I just took out a little bit of liquid and I tried to get a little bit of the muck off the bottom, a little bit of the detritus. And I put that on the slide. So if you look again at this picture I showed you, you can see there's a little bit of stuff on there. And that also allowed me to look more closely at the area on the slide because otherwise you're just moving a slide with a drop of water, which as you know, a drop of water looks like nothing. <laughs> it's just clear glass. And I was moving it around trying to find things. And so on my second attempt, I went ahead and put a little bit of that dreck in there. And then I went ahead and I took videos for you guys. So here we go. Um, let's see if it plays. There we go. So you can see there's a little bit of motion. <laughs> You're like, does this get any better, Mark? It does. Um, I believe these kind of elongated things that we're looking at are a type of diatom. But I do know there are diatoms that are triangles, like a slice of pizza. Uh, but I believe some diatoms are square, and that's what I think these guys are. And you know, I'm just f learning about this. I'm sharing with you what I picked up over the last you know few days. But here is a zoom in on that patch of dreck, and you can see some activity in there. And that weird thing that's moving around, that is actually an osteopsis uh, cell, a type of dinoflagellates. There's some other stuff in here too. You'll see some other bugs and you'll see worms. Um, I, I was told last night what those two white bugs are, but I, I didn't save it here to tell you now, but it was posted on my Facebook because at, um, Chad from Brief Nutrition saw it. So uh, I just thought it was pretty interesting to see what's in our water. And like I said, I mean, I had just the slightest speck of dirt on that slide and when you're looking at this kind of stuff, you're like, wow, there's, <laughs> I mean, to me, 
it's kind of really interesting because, you know, all you think about is there's sand and supposedly there's bacteria, right? I mean, quote unquote bacteria. Um, we know there's bacteria, but, you know, we never see it. So I don't even know what these long stick looking things are that were inside my sample. I really don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's the type of hair algae. And then this ginormous worm. Oh my goodness, what is this thing? And it was when I saw this thing that I thought, wow, I really should not be starting a siphon on my water change hose with my mouth. <laughs> I mean, this was in two drops of water in this giant thing, which was absolutely invisible on the slide until I put it under the microscope. And it looked enormous compared to everything else on the screen. And uh, people were asking me what magnification I was at. I have no idea. I kept turning the thing and adjusting and switching and changing out the optical piece. So I couldn't possibly tell you. But uh, there were obviously some where I was at 1,000. There was some where I was at uh, 60. There was some where I was at 40. And then I had that 25 magnifier on top. So it changes all the numbers. But there was a couple of different sizes of this worm. This one here was the larger one. And I was zoomed down to 40 times. And... Um, but you can see the locomotion of some of these creatures, which I thought was kind of interesting. Now, when it comes to, uh, to dinoflagellates, we know that they can hurt our tanks. And uh, they, can, they can be toxic to the livestock. And when you put in a cleanup crew, a lot of times they eat this stuff and they die. And you're just like, well, what am I supposed to use to get rid of this? And so people think, well, I should do a water change. I don't know what these guys are either. This is one of the things I was asking about. What is this thing? It kind of looks a little bit like a flatworm of sorts. I don't know what it is. But you can see the cilia on its body it uses to move and to uh, yeah, touch things. So um, if you do have dinoflagellates in your tank, we know, generally speaking, don't do a water change because every time you put in new water, it seems to fuel their growth and make them even more abundant. Um, and, uh, you know, stirring the sand and trying to kick it up into the water column may or may not be beneficial. It really comes down to what kind of dinoflagellates you have. And that is where I had to find out what I had. And I had to buy a microscope to find out. Because if you go into the group, and let me hit pause on this for one sec. Well, we'll finish, we'll let this go a little bit further. Um, there's only a, like four and a half minutes of video here. But uh, the group has different types that they identify to help you know what is the proper solution. Because if you don't know what you're dealing with, you could be using the wrong product to resolve what's going on in your aquarium and or you can exacerbate it make it even worse because you put in the wrong thing and you fueled these guys because you didn't know what you're doing so it's much better to know exactly what you're dealing with all right i believe that is the end of that video so initially i thought i was going i was dealing with a, a i think it was called a large cell um Dang it. Amphidium? Amphidian? I'm trying to remember. Uh, let me go ahead and move this out of my way so I can get this. I would. I do want to put this up on the screen. So this is the group I've been a member of forever. It's called My Max Reef Dinoflagellate Support Group. And it's been around for years. They've got uh, 14,000 members and they are there to answer your questions. So if you are not a member of this on Facebook, just join. It's free to join and you can put the microscopic pictures of what you've got in your tank and they will give you some support and directions of how to solve the problem in your tank. When I uh, showed up in the group, I said, I finally get to participate because <laughs> I don't deal with dinoflagellates. Matter of fact, I don't even know how my tank got it. Uh, it definitely wasn't a lack of nutrients because my little uh, 27 gallon that is named Caitlin's Reef, that one has minimal filtration and really water changes are the only way to export the bad stuff. Um, my nitrates are around 10. Phosphates were crazy high, but I brought them down with some phosphate RX. But I was thinking I might have large cell, whatever that word was, uh, but it wasn't. That's why I don't know what it's called because I, you know, it was just something someone told me. But I was told if you have large cell, then you're going to need this from Brightwell called Sponge Excel, which contains silicates. And you dose the silicates, and then in a matter of a week or two, that large cell thing goes away. But since I don't have that, I bought a bottle I don't need. <laughs> I mean, maybe one day I will, but in the meantime, I'm not going to put it in the tank if that's not the cure. Um, I do know what the cure is now that I've gotten help from everyone. And uh, let me throw a picture of it on the screen here. Give me one second to find it. So... 
I'm dumping it onto here. Please stand by. Please stand by. <laughs> so this thing here is going to be my solution for that little tank. So this is a small hang on back UV sterilizer that is designed to kill this type of um, dinoflagellate, the Ostrops Ostriopsis. And um, the thing about it is that at night, remember I told you how the sand gets kind of clear? It turns out that's when this thing becomes free swimming. And so it can actually travel right through the UV and be destroyed. So let me show you guys that. Let me switch screens here for a moment. So here is what one looks like. And it's an almond-shaped beast with a white tip. And interestingly, even though it was on a slide with a cover slip on top, it was twirling, <laughs> not spinning. It was twirling like a leaf in the wind, just tumbling. I was like, how is it tumbling? I mean, think how small it has to be for it to tumble within that slip of water between two pieces of glass. That's crazy, right? And uh, in my, I noticed that where I had like the dense detritus, I'd see one or two. But then when I went further out on the slide to the perimeter where it was just water and none of the stuff, I found way more of them. And that's what made me think, huh, maybe these are not attracted to the substrate and they're more of a free swimming type of animal, which is exactly what I was told they are. So I need to buy that UV that I'm telling you about and I'm gonna have to hang it on Caitlin's tank on the back. I'm gonna have to modify the lid or, or make a new lid made to hand, handle this situation. Um, I've been kind of thinking about different ideas of things I can do with different principles. Like when I want to do phosphate RX, I'd like to somehow mount a sock in the top solid piece of the uh, cover that's on her tank and then have water pump from the tank into that sock and then make the sock removable. I'd like to do that. I've been playing with that thought for some time. Um, and uh, it's tricky with these all-in-one tanks or, or in a tank where it's just nothing. I mean, in this case, that's a 27 gallon that has no type of... Uh, back filter in there at all it's just literally uh well five pieces of glass held together it's almost rimless except it has trim and so i made a solid top but if i wanted to do something with like a power head and then a four inch filter sock that's in there for overnight for me to do some deeper cleaning or to catch the flocculent from phosphate rx i'd like something that looks kind of neat and uh, i've been playing with how to design that for some time so there's that and now i've got to figure out how to attach this uh, filter I showed you guys a second ago. Um, oh, not this one. It was right here. This uh, UV sterilizer. So this one right here I'm showing you, it's an 8 watt. There's also a 35 watt. The rule is that you need 1 watt per 3 gallons when you're dealing with this specific dinoflagellate. So I will be putting this on the tank when I can get my hands on it. I've already asked Frank's tank if he can get me this. If not, I'll order it online. But um, and I will rig it onto the back of the tank and let it go ahead and do its job. And uh, I think I'll run it at night when it's doing the most benefit. One of the side effects of running a UV is that it can add heat to the water and raise the tank temperature. So if I run it at night when the light is off, you know, when the you know, in generally speaking, the tank is running cooler, it shouldn't affect tank temperature at all. But um, if it does warm it up briefly for, you know, a week or two, so be it. I'd much rather kind of get this under control and get my sand back to beautiful niceness again than not. Now, uh, something else that can help in this particular dinoflagellate battle apparently is to run good carbon. Um, I use lignite carbon that I bought from Blue Life USA a long time ago. I have 15, 20 pounds of it left. And uh, I have this little cartridge that fits inside that CJ Shark Pro filter that hangs in the back of the tank. And so it's got two sponges and then there's this little basket and I filled it up with carbon. And of course it clarifies the water, but it'll trap some of the toxins coming off of this dinoflagellate, which is bad for the tank. So there is the benefit of that. And you know I can put that in there for about a week and then change it out. And that will kind of help keep things safe for the livestock in the tank. And then um, another thing that you can dose is some phytoplankton, which is supposed to help outcompete. And then finally, BioDigest, which is something from Prodibio that I've been using for years in the big tank, is a recommendation for the small tank. 
So, be, and then people have mentioned adding pods, you know, some kind of a copepod to help, I guess, outcompete or consume these guys. Strangely, right? You put in a cleanup crew and this dinoflagellate kills them, but they're suggesting putting in pods, which I would think would be eating it. So it's funny that the cleanup crew can't survive it, but this pod can. But it all comes down to knowing how it all plays together as a group. And uh, so in the case here, as the things I showed you, it's just a matter of finding that sweet spot to get things back on track so that I can have a nice clean sand bed and not have toxicity in the water and uh, get it resolved. So unfortunately, this is one of those projects where it costs some money to fix it. You know, normally one of the, the uh, tenets of this hobby is when there's a problem, do water changes. But water changes fuel dinoflagellate growth. So here's $100 for the microscope to find out what I have in the first place. And then the UV sterilizer, that's probably a couple of hundred dollars that I got a rig on there. And uh, then if I have to buy phytoplankton or copepods, you know, it's another 50 bucks. <laughs> so it could be, you know, three, four hundred dollars trying to solve this. And obviously the bigger the tank, the exponentially more expensive everything gets when you're trying to get under control. But having a pretty tank is, of course, our goal. And so I thought this would be a good topic to uh, address with you guys. I've been told this is not the vicious one. But for some reason, you know, some comments were like, this is one of the most toxic ones. So it's kind of like a 50-50 a, a conversation. There's still a lot of information that I have not gleaned yet. I, I did some reading trying to understand it myself, and I just wanted to share what I'd learned so far with you to give you, a, you know, some insight in case you either are dealing with this or may deal with it in the future. But again, seeing brown dusting on your sand, don't panic immediately. That could be part of starting a new tank, the cycling phase, where, uh, you know, we go through ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and then... You know, within a few weeks, we start seeing this dusting on the on the sand. That is normal. That's typically a diatom outbreak, which um, is food for other things, and it helps the bacteria grow in the tank. And then, you know, later on, you go through what's called the ugly phase during month three or four, and your sand might not be as pristine as you'd like. And again, it could be another burst of diatoms, but uh, it doesn't mean you just don't jump into dinoflagellates. But if you do feel that you have some kind of a problem going on, the best way to know if you do is to have a microscope to actually look and find out. And it's so funny. I've been wanting to get one for years, but I just never, ever knew which one to buy. And I'd gone to Amazon plenty of times looking at the list of choices and, you know, not really knowing what to buy. So when Michael gave me the suggestion, I was like, add to cart. <laughs> and it was here the next morning. It was funny. It got here so, so quickly. But then the uh, slide kit I needed, the glass slides, it didn't show up for like five or six days and so I just kept waiting because I was like I want to put in this stuff but uh, now I'm glad I didn't put it in at all because it would not have helped what whatsoever um, so that's kind of the latest um, and uh, I hope that the, you found that semi-interesting that was our topic for today I kept it really quick 23 minutes <laughs> not bad at all um, if you've dealt with dinoflagellates I'd love to hear from you Let's see, what else happened this week? Um, <clears throat> the most interesting thing that happened was an upgrade to the front of my house where my driveway that has been cracked and crumbling for a long time, and it, I've, it's probably the original, so it makes it 50 years old. That was torn out, and a brand new one was poured. So I'm very excited. I still can't park on it yet because the concrete is new. But uh, in about four more days, I can finally put my vehicle on there and I'll be excited to do that because I have this huge walkway that I had them add next to it. So when I open the door, I can just step on the concrete and come in the house. And uh, I'm very happy about that. Here, I'll show you guys. Let me find you a picture. I'll share it with you. I know it has nothing to do with the reef keeping, but, you know, you guys. I like to keep you in the loop. This is a good picture right here. Select. All right, it's sending to the computer now. So here it is. Try it one more time. Here it is. That is my new driveway. And um, they did a great job. And they did it in like two days flat. You know, the, on the third day is when they took the forms away. So it's beautiful. It's got the nice walkway going straight up to the front door. I love that. And um, it'll be great to park on it. <laughs> I actually like that color. I almost wish it was that color. But it's going to be, you know, the white con uh, concrete look. It's going to be much lighter. 
So be it, whatever. It's better than parking on a bunch of cracks and earth falling apart uh, <laughs> beneath my vehicle. I didn't like that. Oh, thank you very much, Triggerfish. I appreciate that. It said, I finally ordered the magnetic stirrer from your shop. Yeah, the smart stirrer is fantastic for water testing. It's all I use. And it's funny, yesterday I was looking, <laughs> I wanted to make hamburgers. And uh, I had bought some hamburger buns and they were gone. I was like, that's weird. And I thought, you know, I bet they fell behind the dryer because, or the washer, because it shakes and that's where I throw things. And uh, yep, there they were. And next to it was my original 3D printed magnetic stirrer that had fallen back there a long time ago. I didn't even know it. So I retrieved it with my new VCA tongs that I showed you guys last week and um, threw it away because <laughs> it was ruined. It got flooded with water uh, a year, no, oh, two years ago. The, uh, there's no update on Caitlin's, uh, I'm sorry, on the anemone cube yet. Uh, busy little week with all the concrete work being done and everything else associated with that. But uh, this next week is my plan to uh, find myself a nearby, um, what do you call it? I don't think it's a lumber yard, but maybe it is. I, I've got to go somewhere to find this specific type of wood I need to finish out the stand so I can stain it, seal it, get it in here and get the tank on there and plumb it in. So... I'm embarrassed how long it's taken me to get this project completed. It's shocking. I looked up when I took the anemone cube down, and it was two years ago. Two years ago! That means my temporary tank that I set up that I thought would only have to last a few months has done a fantastic job holding together for, um, you know, two solid years, holding all the anemones and clownfish safely behind the reef tank. But they're totally in my way, and I need them out of there. So it's... A priority in my life now is to get that done. Uh, the other priority that's going on right now is finishing up what's going on with Coral Magazine because it goes to print here in um, about 12, no, about less, about nine days. So there's, you know, lots to do with getting everything prepared before the deadline. And um, so my, my life is going to be hectic for some time, but I look forward to taking a three-day break once we go to press. That'll be great. If you, um, I'll throw this on the screen because I, I didn't do it before. Let's see, where did I hide it? It's here somewhere. Actually, you know what? Let me find the real one because what I have was wrong. Okay. Ah, it's empty. That's funny. Well, how about this one? Let's see what it looks like. Yep, no, that's the wrong one. So um, anyway, I won't show it to you. <laughs> Never mind. <sighs> Let's see. Are there any questions here? This is your chance. This could be the, the shortest live stream we've done on this channel. I should throw the question slides up. Let me see if I can do some switcheroo here. Do this. And let's see if we can get this to cooperate. Of course not. That'd be too easy. There we go. So we've got all these things on the screen at once. <laughs> this is why I got you near my list of questions. I can see the chat. Um, Reefkeeper says, you know, talking about the dinos I found in my system, you're lucky you got one of the easy ones to take care of. Michael says, why would one of my tangs start picking on a leather coral? Oh, that, that can happen. I uh, had a powder blue tang that was chewing on my toadstool leather, and I didn't know that leather could look completely different because I had them at the same time. And when I lost the powder blue, that leather became a beautiful coral. I was like, wow, it was actually worth, you know, in the end, it was a win even though I would never would have anticipated that or expected that. But uh, you said, why would it start? I don't know. Not feeding it enough? <laughs> it's a possibility. Aw, Jake says that he's got dinoflagellates. Jake, I hope you figured out what kind you have um, because obviously you want to get rid of it in your tank. 
Uh, there was articles written about this years ago. I mean, 20 years ago. And uh, it was a real... And it only happened to a handful of people. I mean, really, it was not like nowadays. It seems like everyone's dealing with it. Just crazy amounts of people having dinoflagellates. And I still don't even know how it got into my tank. I, I don't know what caused it. You know, everything I get goes through a dip. So in theory, it's uh, cleaned off before it goes into that tank. Or if it's just the ideal conditions. I mean, I have to feel that I introduced it somehow. Otherwise, how would it be there at all? Uh, Roscoe says, what eats red turf algae? My snails and my urchin won't uh, touch it. The uh, There's really not something specific that can devour it properly. And it is one of those ones that in the past when I was dealing with it, I found that the simplest solution was to just let it burn itself out. So I, 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 whenever I have an algae problem, I knock down my phosphates. And I always use Phosphate RX because Phosphate RX is a liquid fo flocculant. You put in the fixed amount of drops into the aquarium. The water turns cloudy. The phosphate that's in the water column turns solid and can be trapped in a filter sock, like a 10 micron sock. Or possibly uh, it could be, or you know, of course not possibly. It can definitely be exported via protein skimmer as well. But filter socks are the, is the preferred uh, attack these days because you can catch it really quickly and remove it from the water column so it doesn't uh, stay in there so long for the fish to inhale it through their gills. But uh, for nine years, we didn't have the choice of using fine micron filter socks. And I just put it in the tank and my protein skimmer pulled it out overnight. And the next morning, the water was crystal clear and the phosphate level was lower. Now, if you put in phosphate or X in a tank that has no phosphate, the water won't turn milky white. And not milk, cloudy, opaque. Um, if you don't see it creating a cloud, then you don't have any. And your test kit is telling you the truth. But a lot of times you'll have tanks that have some type of algae problem and they'll say, yeah, but when I measure it, it shows super low. I'm like, no, I bet it's not low. And uh, one of the things you could do to make it show up on a test kit is to rip out a whole bunch of algae, you know, working in the tank, blowing off rock work and stuff with a turkey based or a power head, and then test your water like 10 minutes later while everything's all kicked up. And you might show a, a higher level of phosphate than you originally saw when you did your test the first time. But uh, red turf algae is one of those ones there wasn't really a specific thing that just devoured it like you would hope. Um, the, at least I'm not familiar with it. So uh, usually it was just one of those things where you endured it for a while and then suddenly you just realize it was gone. Now, uh, knocking down phosphates is the first approach because you're starving the plant of any kind of beneficial stuff to grow with. And then another product that might help <clears throat> would be uh, Live Rock Enhance, which is a product from Reef Bright. And that one there helps make rock cleaner and, you know, the turf algae is on the rock. So there is a chance that it could help to eliminate it. It's a type of uh, waste-consuming bacteria that you're adding to your tank. So maybe that would assist. But I, I can't just say, oh, you need a margarita snail or you need a bumblebee or, or something specific. Unfortunately, I don't know of any snail that or urchin that targets it specifically. Um... <clears throat> Triggerfish says, ask Sean why Fritz got a bunch of their products at Petco, but not their salt. I don't know the answer. I, I could ask him that. I um, do know that you can get in different places. But, uh, you know, of course, your local fish store can bring it in, which is no problem. And uh, saltwateraquarium.com ships it all over the nation, so that can get it to your door. But I don't know why Petco doesn't have it. Winderwater says, does getting a foamy surface in the sump indicate that something bad is coming? It's not in the skimmer for sure. Um, that could be, you say foamy, it's kind of like bubbly stuff. That, um, I know what you're talking about. And my brain is fixed on dinoflagellates. So I'm thinking it's dinoflagellates. And I don't know if I'm remembering that correctly. It's too long ago. But I did get this weird stuff on the surface it, and it acted sort of like a bacteria. It kind of acted like some kind of a slime. And I would use either a fish net that, you know, the kind that has a really fine mesh bag, not the kind with all the holes. And I would just scoop it off the surface. Another trick that I used was use a ladle and I would take the ladle and push it down in the water so that that stuff that was on the surface would fall into the spoon. It's very tedious. But you do that and you capture it and lift it out and dump it into a little bucket and then you 
do it again. And I just kept doing that until I get remove it all. And then whatever's left that you couldn't get off the surface, you can remove that with paper, like the kind of paper you put in your printer. Just this stuff. And you just take a sheet of this and you lay it right on the surface of the water in your sump and you just peel off and all the junk sticks to it. And then you take another piece of paper and you do it again and again until you've blotted it all clean. This also works on the surface of your tank if you have an oil slick. So you can do that to remove stuff that was um, pooling up at one end that the circulation's not getting out of the tank for whatever reason. Uh, if you do have an oil slick on your surface of your aquarium, by the way, you should definitely make sure to remove it uh, by either putting a power head to blow up at the surface to keep it churning and tumbling, or um, look at how the lock line is arranged and maybe aim some at that area to keep it moving. But, uh, you know, it just happens. Some tanks do that. And you want to make sure that it doesn't because it inhibits oxygen exchange. We want the, the degassing of the aquarium. So it's important that the surface not be oily. And if you, and the best way to look is look up, you know, bend down and look up at the surface of your tank and just see if there's anything weird, if there's any patches or not. And then, like I said, the paper on top is the easiest way to peel it right off. Um... Roscoe, I do sell the filter socks. <laughs> yes, I do. There are 10 micron socks. I was trying to think what you were asking about. Uh, Papa plays bass <laughs> or bass. <laughs> it says with osteopsis, osteopsis, I keep feeling I should say osteoporosis. Osteopsis, uh, an extended lights out period, two days maybe, will help them from help keep them free swimming and thus more likely to go through your UV. Oh, I like that. Uh, yeah, I was reading about it. And in the document in that same group I pointed you guys to, it said that there's really no way to uh, like just make them go away by leaving the lights off for a duration. It could take six or eight weeks of no lights, which would of course wipe out all the corals in the tank and cause new issues. But a couple of days off could keep them swimming around, which is true. I like that suggestion. And having it off for two or three days won't be a problem for a bunch of zoanthids and gorgonians, especially one that's non-photosynthetic. And yeah, uh, E-I or L, I don't know what I'm reading here. E-L-Y? E-I Kumar says there are surface skimmers that are used in planted tanks. I saw one at Aquashala last year. And it was a little small power head that had this weird circle on the top. And he kept calling it a skimmer. And I was thinking, no, that's not a skimmer. How is that a skimmer? But it was. It was a surface skimmer, not a protein skimmer. And he was talking about how it does such a good job of catching all the stuff. And you take the cup off. And it, and it was self-adjusting, which I thought was pretty neat too. But I was thinking, this is definitely something for freshwater people. It's not something for the salty people. Um, I don't know how long it would even hold up in a saltwater environment, just based on the design. Oh, I got a story for you guys. Uh, Triggerfish says, my daughter will be three years old in April and already wants to do my water tests. See, isn't it great when you can pass the buck <laughs> and say, here, you do it and let me know what the numbers are. I mean, come on, that's great for kids. They actually like the science-y stuff sometimes. Uh, I do have a story for you. Um, my grandson was here last weekend and uh, they he wanted me to play a game with him on his iPad. And he said, I want you to, uh, you know, he says, which one? You know, I said, what do you want to play? And um, I, he said, well, SpongeBob SquarePants. I was like, absolutely not. No way, not in this house. <laughs> so he found a car racing game. And the cool thing was to play this game, you would hold the iPad and you would tilt it like you're driving a car. That was how you drove it. And then you touched the screen and it went through the boost and made you fast. So anyway, he's showing me this game that he races on the, on the the through this weird canyon. And at the end, he he ended in fourth place. And I said to him, why did you end in fourth place? What's wrong with you? <laughs> He's six and a half years old. I'm like, what's wrong with you? I said, you let three cars get there before you? Why? And he was like, here, you do it. So he hands me the iPad. I've never played this game before in my life. And I'm just like driving around, not slamming into anything, hitting the occasional boost because usually I missed them. And I won first place. And I'm like, see, it's so easy. What's wrong with you? Do better. 
And his parents are there, you know, my son and my daughter-in-law. Like, wow, Grandpa, way to be so, uh, what do they say? So supportive to your grandson. I was like, he needs to do better. This is really sad. <laughs> it was so funny. And, you know, the best part was he was laughing, too. You know, he wasn't even slightly offended, which was, you know, the whole point. It's me messing with him. It's not me trying to tear down this innocent child. Some of you are like, you're so mean. I'm like, no. And I told one of my good friends what I did. And he said, Mark, I can't blame you at all. And I would have been worse. <laughs> I think we all have it in us to be a little bit worse with, with, the, with the little ones. Aw. Winterwater says, uh, my four-year-old daughter loves to feed the corals with a turkey baster. That's great. That's great. Yeah, getting the kids involved now is perfect because later on in life, they could also have an aquarium. So you're, you're teaching them early about life. They get to see the reaction from food in the water. They they get to show their friends what they know. I mean, I still to this day remember when my son would come in from skateboarding with his little sweaty buddies. <laughs> they all smelled terrible. And they're standing in front of the tank. And my son was like, that's Neptasia. That's a this. That's a that. And they're all like, oh, okay. And I'm like, wow. He actually listens to me because, you know, I tended to believe that he ignored everything I said because he didn't care about it like I did. But uh, yeah, our kids definitely get a chance to be the future hobbyists. Oh no, Roscoe said, if you're having someone tank sit your tank while you're on vacation, don't make my mistake. I told them to turn off the skimmer every other day and they turned off that tank instead. <sighs> That's the worst. <laughs> that is the worst. It, it's just like, ugh. It's really good if you can show the tank sitter what you want to do in advance, like one or two visits first, um, possibly demonstrate like specifically what you're doing and or provide little video clips. Like this is how I turn the lights off. This is how I fix the protein scammer. This is how I, you know, this is what the water should look like. And then if it say, if it doesn't look like this, you can call or text me and I'll answer you. Or you can call this local fish store because they're in town and I'm not, and they can take over whatever's wrong. Because they are your eyes. They are there to double check. And then, of course, if you have, you know, webcams to point at your tank, that can also help because you can take a look. Having um, a controller may or may not help uh, unless the controller notifies you that the system is off. But, yeah, those kind of mistakes. I remember uh, Caitlin had this beautiful aquarium with some really, really nice livestock. <clears throat> and she was traveling, and she asked her boyfriend to turn off Jack stop to turn off the light each night because she didn't have a timer on it and he never turned off the light so the tank completely bleached out and then he assumed everything died and so he literally threw everything away when she came back from her trip it was gone Jack stop they can hear that be quiet sorry about that um and she lost some you know very rare fish and a beautiful anemone and uh, there was like, no, she couldn't even come home to fix it because it was gone. Threw it all away. Craziness. So having some way to make sure your tank sitter knows what you want done is ideal. Uh, feeding is so important. And that is, usually that's what we want them to do. We want them to show up and tell us that everything is swimming right side up. And, you know, put food in the tank. And Because we can automate feeding these days. We have automatic feeders and we have pellet food. And with different brands you can put in there. And it can put in. But having someone walk in... And just know that the tank has a pulse is really, really important. And then having your phone number to call or text you, of course, would be best. They can send you a short video clip and say, hey, this is what's going on. Is this normal? And it's nice to have that kind of support. Uh, and I've, you know, I've had the same tank sitter for a long time. Occasionally, I've had to have someone else step in when he was not available. And it's always frustrating because it's like they're not as good. As, I, that's why I always say you need a Bobby because <laughs> Bobby is so good at uh, taking care of my system. And so when I have to have someone else do it, uh, I mean, I had one, I was on a trip and uh, my protein skimmer apparently overflowed and it completely wasted water from the reef tank. Check, stop. And the water went, um, hang on a second. Bring this back up here. There she goes. Uh, the, the water was draining to the waste collector. The waste collector was overflowing and it, for some reason, 
I think it just was so much so fast that before it could turn off the skimmer, it already dumped water over the floor. And But I was getting these notifications that the waste collector is full. And it was like the first day of Macna. And I was going to be gone for three more days. And I was at the Neptune group. and say, like, how can I stop this alarm from pinging me every hour for the next 72 times in a row? And somebody says, you can just turn that off. So I did turn that off. It wasn't the alarm I turned off. I turned off that float switch. But when I turned off that switch, I basically said the skimmer can resume. And so now the skimmer continued to overflow and flood the room even worse. And the person that was watching my tank just said, hey, your fish room's all wet. And uh, I didn't know what to do, so I left. <laughs> Where Bobby would have solved it because he knew what to do. And I came home from that trip and I just opened the door and it smelled bad. And I just put my two suitcases down and walked straight into the fish room and saw the water everywhere and solved the problem. And then, you know, I guess it was like an hour or two later, I was actually picking up my suitcases and throwing stuff in the laundry and cleaning myself up and going to bed. But it was so fr super frustrating that that had happened and that the person who was a hobbyist himself, had a reef tank, didn't figure out how to resolve the problem, just kind of threw his hands up in the air and left. And, you know, just sort of like, okay, you have, you have a flooded room. And I was like, man, are you kidding me? So that was annoying. Let's see. Rick says I'm a mean grandpa <laughs> with a pointy finger. <laughs> I don't feel guilty. Uh, Michael says, thank you for answering all my questions. I watch you every week and you answer all my questions. I just wanted to thank you for what you do. That's why I'm here. I'm literally here every Saturday to help you guys. I do it on purpose. Neil says, can you keep different anemones in one tank? You can sometimes. It just depends some different species don't get along. But like, for example, if you wanted to have a whole bunch of rock anemones, all the different colors, you can totally do that. You can have a blanket of them across the tank and it'd be awesome. If you are trying to have different bubble tips, it's sort of 50-50. Some tolerate each other, some don't. It seems like the, the ones that cost a lot, the high-end ones, usually don't seem to like the cheaper ones. <laughs> I can't explain why. It's really funny. You put in a sunburst or the normal rose bubble tip, and it seems like the rose just withers away. There's some kind of chemical issue. But if you, um, there, you can do some trial and error, but you know, it's kind of expensive, an expensive way to figure that out. So instead, I would talk to other hobbyists about what you're trying to put together in the tank and get some feedback. Um, I know that sometimes people say, well, I want a carpet anemone and I want a long tentacle anemone. And I also want a bubble tip. And it's like, mm, I'd usually just pick the one. Uh, and then there's the other ones, like the tube anemones that, um, that are really, really pretty and need to be in an area of very, very low flow. So you've got lots of different choices. So it really comes down to what you want to keep. So what you could do is go into Club Milo's Reef and you could post in there your list of choices. And then, you know, all of us can chime in and give you some, some advice of what will work and what to avoid. Sometimes it's not just that the anemones are, uh, it's not like they're touching and fighting. It could be that they're fighting through the water column with something called allopathy, which is a chemical warfare where, for example, I had the rose, rose anemones inside my anemone cube and I put in something that was sold to me as a weird looking uh, bubble tip. And I kept saying, man, I don't think it's a bubble tip. And it turns out it was a sea bay, but it was really pretty. And I was like, yeah, I want that. And I put it in the tank with the anemones. And that little sea bay, you know, it stayed down on the sand away from everything. And then it started to shrivel up. And I thought, you know, it's getting smaller. That's not a good sign. I think there's chemical warfare. So I scooped it out and I put it in the 400 gallon reef instead. And that is the anemone that's been in that tank now for seven or eight years. And it's beautiful and gorgeous. And uh, it's even survived a trip into, the, into a face plant, into a vortex pump and recovered. So um, sometimes being in the same cube of water, it doesn't work out. But interestingly, the anemone cube and the 400 gallon share the same sump. So technically it's all the same water, but there's no chemical issue. And now I have a big, huge rose anemone next to that same sea bay. And they seem completely fine side by side. But why was it so shrinking away when it was in a tank full of anemones? I don't know.
<laughs> the Zen Ginger says, if you have an older kid not doing much with their life, let them continue living with you so you have a built-in fish keeper when you go on vacation. I may be speaking from experience. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, rather be traveling, great name, says, I'm going to be in India for 30 days. My sister is watching the tank. Not looking forward to the phone calls. Well, I mean, since she will be calling you in India, you can do all the tech support. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> but, um, you know, if it, it really helps if the, the person, like your sister, has come over a few times in advance. And also, putting the food in individual uh, portions, I know you're gone 30 days, but literally I would pack for the whole month and say this is what goes in each day and you can write the date right on the top of the container i was using those little tiny uh it's not a deli cup it's more like a, uh, a condiment cup you know like for salsa or for pico de gallo or has a little lid and i i remember i used to go to uh, some tex-mex place and you know when you order your food then you go over to the station to get the little bits you want of stuff and i would grab like 10 or 20 of those cups and take them home but eventually I just bought a sleeve of them. So I just had all my own. I'm not stealing them from the restaurant. And I would fill them up and I would put the date on top or I'd say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or whatever. And, you know, at this point, Bobby knows just grab a cup each day. It's no big deal. But if you're really not trusting the person watching the tank, you want them to know exactly how much food goes in a day. You want them to totally understand your top off system. Like you could say, this is my top off container and only holds a few gallons, but here's my huge trash can of good water. And I need you to put some of this in that container when it gets low every three days and uh, don't let it run dry. I mean, you have to be very specific on things like that. You have to say, this is what the protein skimmer is supposed to sound like, and then maybe turn it off. Not like this. Or if it's overflowing, this is the knob you twist to stop it from overflowing. I mean, there's certain things you really should tell them and really important to tell them the lights should not be on all the time so you want them to be on for a specific amount you need to have them in a timer but they should know if they come over at a certain hour like let's say they came late in the evening and the lights are still on they should know that's not right you know and then of course if you have a webcam point of the tank you could check on a different when you have opportunities you could check and just see if things seem kind of normal from your remote location like you are when you're in india Uh, D Cobbler says, just raise the iron. Dinos are dunsky. Uh, I was putting in iron, hoping it would take care of this. That was the thing Chris Meckley recommended to me two weeks ago, and it wasn't solving anything. And it's because this one here was not the right type of dinos. If it was a different kind, the iron might have been the solution. Just like if it was a different one, the silica might have been the solution. But so far, iron and silica are not my choices. And so instead, it's going to be UV to get rid of it and it's going to be putting in additional bacterias and putting in phytoplankton and running carbon to absorb the toxins. Roscoe says I need to write a book on reef keeping. Well, I am writing a coral magazine every two months for the rest of my life. <laughs> it's like little books. EIY says, will Monty Cap and Monty Digitata sting each other and kill? No, actually, they won't. They can intertwine. You can have a beautiful Capricornus with a Digitata in the center like a bouquet, and it can look really, really pretty. And if they happen to touch each other, usually they just kind of coexist and grow around as the other one grows upward. They're both Montipora, so they do get along. Um, it's not an absolute rule, but generally speaking, yes, they should be fine together. Winder Water says that my bubble tip anemone was cut up into small pieces by my Nero pump, so now I have so many tiny anemones. That's uh, surprising. Usually you'll have, you know, the survivor, but the scraps don't turn into new ones. So the fact that you got a bunch of little ones is kind of cool. Jared says, do you still use the Neptune Sky, and have you had any problems with the lights? I'm now, I think, mine are three years old. I run three of them over the 400-gallon tank. This is what it looks like. Let me switch to that video and then fix my microphone. Let me find it. It's here somewhere. Right here. And my microphone is still on. So that is being lit only with sky. That was in the morning at 12 o'clock, you know, noon, uh, because my tank starts at 11 a.m. 
and uh, or 11:30 really. So the tank was lighting up, and I just filmed this around January 2nd of. So it's a month old uh, since I filmed this. And uh, of the three lights, I had one that gave me something called a fan error, and one of the fans, the cooling fans, wasn't spinning. And when I contacted Neptune for some tech support, they ended up saying, let's just replace the light. And they sent me another one out and I just swapped it. And um, other than that, no issues whatsoever. I love that I can just do some buttons in my infusion and I can pick whatever color I want. You know, I have my normal set schedule for every single day. But the rest of the time, it's just, like I said, it's just doing its schedule. But if I need specifically, I want it to be blue right now, or I want it to be daylight, or I want to take pictures, I can just flip a switch in Fusion and immediately switch the lights. And I really like that a lot. And that was something I didn't get to do with my metal halides. They were either on or they were off. And I was always, you know, trying to just make the best with the lighting at that time. But now I can have a spectrum on demand, so to speak, and pick exactly the color I need before I start filming or taking pictures or if I need to have a little bit more light for a few more minutes because I didn't feed the fish yet. And it's like, oh my goodness, it's 11 o'clock. I can flip a switch and activate them really quickly. And then I can even install other people's lighting schedules with Fusion real easily. I can just go to the light schemes and pick a different one and say, I want Dwayne's and uh, it'll let me have his whole uh, selection for the day. But he uh, gave me an example of a nice virtual switch that he calls evening mode. And so it's got that bluish hue and it's kind of dim and it's just nice and calming and relaxing. And occasionally I can flip it to that if I want to and just have that for a duration. And then when I'm done, I switch that virtual switch off and it goes back to whatever the program schedule is that my lighting is. I'm very, very happy with this guy. Very happy. I, um, I remember when they first came out uh, and I got to try them. As soon as I put them on my tank, I was like, I should have done this five years ago, but they didn't exist. You know, I couldn't have done it. I could have done some other brand, but I was really impressed with how the light spread over the tank. It got, I didn't have shadows. I didn't have the weird um, uh, disco effect that you see on sand beds that happens with some light fixtures. Uh, the light that's over Caitlin's Reef has uh, that problem. And so I did buy a diffuser, but I think it's diffusing the light too much, you know, kind of weakening the signal. So I took out the diffuser and I've seen the little speckles in the sand, but since the sand's kind of dirty, it doesn't matter right now. But I'd prefer to have, you know, even lighting and not see red and blue dots on the sand. I'd rather be traveling, says my fish freak out when lights come on suddenly or change colors. You know, I was thinking the same thing, but I, I watched my fish when I was doing things and they're not reacting. Um, like, for example, when certain light fixtures came out, I think Orphec did at first, maybe. They had a thing where it did cloud cover. And then Ecotech came up with, like, lightning. Uh, yeah, lightning. And so you could have the effect of a rainstorm. And you would think the flash would make all your clownfish just duck for cover. And yet they didn't seem to do... I mean, maybe they do a little bit the very first time. But then they just realize it's no big deal, I guess. And they just kind of adapt and get used to it. Um, Fish Freak Phil, <laughs> great name, says, if I have algae and phosphate and nitrate both read zero, should I dose phosphate even though no reading with different test kits? I would take, what kind of algae do you have, first of all? And um, I would reach in and remove handfuls of it. I would also double check your test kit. There's lots of ways to test your, check, test your test kit. For example, you could take some fish food and you could put it in a small beaker you know, a few grains in here, shake it up, wait 10 minutes, and then take a water sample and see if you get phosphates. And uh, that's one way to know if the kit's still accurate. Uh, test kits are only good for a year. And if they expire, your numbers could be questionable. So we want to make sure that we can trust the numbers. But usually in a tank that has, I mentioned this earlier in this show, when nitrate and phosphate measure zero, but you have algae in your tank, you do have it. It's tip. I've always heard this phrase. I don't even know if it's scientifically accurate, but we say that the Phosphate is bound up in the algae. But I can say, and I, I did say this earlier, if you rip out a bunch of handfuls of algae and then like five, 10 minutes later test the water, you probably will get a phosphate reading in your test kit because now you've stirred up everything and you've uh, unbound what was bound up. And uh, there are different kinds of algae. You know, like Bryopsis is way tougher than Derbasia. And uh, of course, Valonia is a different type of algae. 
but uh, if you're seeing algae in your tank on your rock work and you don't like it, you know, you definitely want to make sure your nutrient levels are correct and you want to have a good cleanup crew. And I had someone just a week ago saying, hey, Mark, I got a problem with algae in my tank. And they said something about their snail. I said, snail singular? Like one snail? You know, what size is this tank? And I think it was a 75 gallon. And, uh, you know, having a urchin and a snail and a hermit crab is not going to be enough to keep up with a 75 gallon aquarium. You know, new or old, it's going to need more critters. And so if the tank's been going for a while and, uh, you have an algae problem that just seems to not be able to get under control, there's a good chance you need more mouths to consume it. And uh, the algae that, I mean, I, I've been saying this forever, and I know not everyone does it, but I do it. Uh, I try to have one critter per gallon. So if I had a 75 gallon tank, I would have 75 critters to keep the algae under control and out of my tank. And that, you know, generally speaking, when you look at my aquarium, you just don't see algae issues. Uh, even Caitlin's Reef, which was doing kind of strangely there for a while, you know, it did, it was funny. It went through a hair algae phase for quite a while. And, and I didn't like it, but I didn't want to put in things that would eat it because I thought they'd eat the good macro algaes I was growing intentionally. So I was in this weird, difficult spot where I wanted one kind of algae, but I didn't want the other one. And uh, then at one point, it just kind of stopped and went away. Craziest thing ever. And uh, then I had a lot of alonia in there, you know, the bubble algae. And uh, at one point I treated for phosphates with phosphate RX to knock the numbers down. And then a lot of that Valonia came out. <laughs> and so the tank's actually a lot more rock work now. It looks a lot cleaner. And I'm almost at the point now where I'm like, you know what? I'm willing to forego all the algaes entirely, just stop and just have, you know, pretty rock work with, you know, some nice corals and just make it a pretty tank for that uh, Japanese pygmy angelfish. Uh, yeah, Bryopsis, okay, so first of all, that's a super hard one to remove, um, but there's some tricks. So number one, you can take a turkey baster or a power head, and you can blow it at the Bryopsis specifically, and we're trying to blow all the detritus out of its base, because Bryopsis is really coarse. You can't just like reach in and pluck it. You can rip off the longer strands, but the stuff that's really coarse is going to be really on the rock, and it holds on super tightly. So if you can blast out, oh, you need trap detritus you know, initially and then repeat every single week, you will start to starve that plant of growth because it's actually creating its own little mini deep sand bed within its own little tufts of algae and it's feeding itself off of that. So by blowing off all your rock work, that's the first step. And then while the water's kind of not so great, that's a perfect time to do a water test and see if your phosphates really are zero because probably they are not. And then... Um, the next step, really the simplest solution of anything out there is to use FluxRx. And FluxRx used at double strength. You know, if the dosage is, you know, let's just say it's a tablespoon, and that's me taking a random number. But if you double the table and you have two tablespoons, that will take care of Bryopsis. If you use three tablespoons, it will take care of Valonia, the bubble algae. So you've got hair algae, Bryopsis at two strength, and then bubble algae at three strength. That is the simplest one to use in a tank, and it's reef safe, and it gets rid of it. And But, I mean, still, you don't want things like that to return, so that's why we put in <clears throat> enough hermit crabs and snails to go ahead and consume new growth as it's happening before it becomes out of control. Gnarly Duck says, Would it be an issue if a recordia attached itself to a shell and then a hermit crab moved into the shell? No, not at all. Actually, it's kind of fun when you see that because now you get to see that recordia all the time everywhere. And I've seen different animals over the years grab a hitchhiker and take it around the tank. I've had some snails walking around with little tiny uh, rose anemones on their backs. Winterwater says, do you think corals consume the lanthanum bound up in the phosphate? Uh, I see Tropic Marin made a phosphate flocculent that made me think about that. I don't know exactly what the corals and fish do with it, but I do know that it is something you want to export. And if you don't have any way of exporting it whatsoever, then it's just going to settle down back into the tank. It'll sit on the, the sand. It'll sit on the rock work. You know, you need to blow it off, get in suspension, get it skimmed out, get it trapped in a filter sock. We want it removed from the system. The whole point of turning it into a solid is to get rid of it. So it's really important to be able to find a solution that works for your system. 
and Caitlin's little tank is not really great for removing phosphate RX, and I know that, but it does knock the number down. Um, but then I'm in there with a gravel vac and I'm sucking the sand bed to get all that stuff out and make sure that I don't have it show up. And the nice thing is when I do tests, you know, with ICP analysis, I'm sorry, when I do an ICP analysis, I use Reef Labs. Uh, that's the kit I sell for my website. The uh, lanthanum number is always low. So I'm not getting like a buildup of lanthanum in my system at all, which is kind of neat because I've been using that stuff for a decade. <laughs> You'd think I'd have the highest levels ever and I don't, not at all. Gnarly Duck says, I'm sure you get the compliment often, but that art behind you is pretty. You know, I've got different things on the wall there. Here, let me show you a couple. So you see this one. This one's from Nori Vossen, and uh, it's a bunch of uh, scolies. And then this one I got at Comic-Con, and I still haven't bought the frame for it yet, but I like it a lot. So it's a diver with a mermaid. But what I liked was that the fish were accurate. <laughs> I was like, look! These actually look like real saltwater fish. It's not some imagination. And the lady that did the painting, you know, this is a print of it. She, um, her name is, uh, I can't read it. Susan Daw, D-A-W-E. And uh, she's a diver herself. So she was accurate. And I was like, I need this. I want it. I bought it. <laughs> so I just need to get myself to buy a frame and get this thing on the wall where it belongs. Because I've had it for a year. I'm just so slow about getting stuff done, it seems like. You know, priorities, right? But uh, yeah, I, I like having that kind of stuff. And then over here, I've got a squid that's actually uh, scientifically accurate. It's got the beak. And I've got a whale shark that a friend of mine made, which is really cute. And uh, her company is called Cozy Critter Design. And I said, I need a whale shark. And I told her I want a real one, like 35 feet long, even though my house, it would be my whole house. <laughs> so she wouldn't do it. And then Nori also, as a gift, made this for me and saved it for a long time till we met up in person. She made this for me in 2021. This is a, a pencil drawing of a whale shark from above. And I thought that was really cool. So I buy some of her art, like you saw those uh, colorful scolies on the wall. And I've got something from her also in my studio outside that has to do with coffee. It actually used a piece of ocean glass and it it's really, really cute. And uh, it's on the front of a coffee mug with the steam coming off. And it says, but first, let's have some coffee. I was like, yes, I love that. <laughs> and Andrea got one too, because she couldn't live without it. I actually bought it for her and then I wouldn't give it up. And I just told her, here, go get your own. <laughs> and don't worry, that is such a Mark thing to do. Uh, I've had a friend tell me, Mark, you are such an only child. And it's true. <laughs> it's really, really true. I'm so bad. Uh, Winterwater says, are there any glowing reef painting artists you can recommend that would ship to Europe? Um, oh, it's such a good question. There are some really cool pieces of art that are in this hobby and some artists. And some of them do things that work really great under black light or under actinic lighting. But what caught my eye was more of these cutouts where they, uh, I'd have to go fetch it. Let me go fetch the one I have because it's, I'm trying to think of the name of the company. All right, so this one here actually glows really nicely. And this was made by Michelle up in Alaska. And she would go to Aquashella and do a lot of the artwork and she paints. And I said, I love this, I have to own it. And then this, I can't remember the company, but maybe some of you guys know in the uh, comment field. This one here is a shark. And it's actually layers of wood that are each layer is painted a different color and then stacked. So you've got some fish in there you got the shark shape and they do this in all these different shapes so you can have dinosaurs you can have a lionfish you can have a jellyfish um i just liked the shark i said i gotta have this but i can't remember the name of the company right now but there's a starfish in here as well there's the gargonians there's a tang yeah it's cool i like it so i like this kind of stuff around my house i have all kinds of fish related stuff here <laughs> 
But then, like you said, who will ship to Europe? That's the question. And um, maybe that company could ship that giant thing. I mean, they make huge, like, cutouts. So you've got this giant jellyfish with all the tendrils, and it's like two and a half, three feet long. And I keep saying, I need that. And maybe this aqua shell, I'll just buy it. I'll just pull the trigger and just get it. Because I can get it in person and not worry about it getting damaged and shipping because it's so big. But um, <clears throat> they have all these different styles. And uh, I really like that kind of stuff. But yeah, getting someone willing to ship it internationally is always a challenge because it costs a lot. You don't know when you're going to get it. Um, it got, has to be packed really, really well. It's very important. Let's see. EIY says, my tank salinity increased with temperature. Um, the total water volume is the same, but last week the temperature was lower and salinity was 1.025, and now it's 1.026. Is it normal or something wrong with my refractometer? Refractometers tend to be um, ATC, which means auto temp compensating. So they, you know, after, after the water's been sitting on the lens for about 20 seconds, it just internally ad makes the adjustment. So having water being 1.025 to 1.026 is totally reasonable from one week to the next. Obviously, we want to stay as consistent as possible. Uh, I would keep it at 1.026 all the time. But you didn't say what the temperature was of the tank. Like, was it 80 last week and now it's 75? I mean, that's a big difference. But if your tank is staying right around 77 day in, day out on a regular basis, your salinity should stay within that margin as well. It may rise up. It might be 1.026. It might be 1.0255. It might be 1.025. But the trick, of course, is not to be 1.021, 1.026. That's a big difference. And that would be the difference between um, topping off with way too much water and then uh, not topping off at all. And so the tank gets super salty. <laughs> Jason, I didn't show your artwork because it's not glowing. I'll go get one of Jason's. <laughs> it's so heavy. So this one is a Centropygi. Flavissima. Came out nice, didn't it? And it's life size. <laughs> That's how big they get. I'm kidding. Um, actually, this is a really, really pretty fish. This was Caitlin's favorite fish, and so that's why Jason made it and sent it as a gift. And it hangs above her tank. So, um, yeah. And then she bought me one as well of Spock. So uh, my Nassau tank, and so for Christmas, Caitlin ordered me that from Jason. He made it. It arrived, and it also hangs. So they hang next to the tank, side by side. You're so funny, Jason. <laughs> like, what else can I take off the walls and rearrange my house for this one live stream? Okie dokie. Any other questions? If not, I think we should wrap this up. So, just want to remind you guys, today is water test Saturday. It's really important that you do test your water parameters because by knowing what they are, you can correct what is going wrong. And we can do it now before the livestock starts to struggle. It's so much better to look at the water parameters, know what they are, make the slight adjustment now, and, this, and everything acts normal. Then everything's all retracted and, and fish are gasping and whatever's wrong and you're trying to fix it quickly. That usually doesn't play out well. So we want to see, you know, it's just like Titanic. You want to steer the ship way before it gets near the iceberg. And so we want to make those turns in those very gradual. <laughs> we don't want to do sudden jerky movements. We don't want to overreact. And we don't want to react suddenly because we were being lazy for weeks and months on end. It's super important that we do this. And it should be done weekly. And if you're doing it weekly, I'm proud of you. And if you're not doing it weekly, I'm mad at you. <laughs> it really is important that you do this. And of course, you can track all of your water parameters in Reef Trace. It's an app that works on iOS and Android, and uh, it's what I use on my phone. So I, I recommend it to you guys as well. 
that is it. I hope that you guys have a great weekend. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Logan says, kick some dino butt. I'm trying. <laughs> and hopefully in a couple of weeks, I can report uh, how things went. And uh, I'll show you guys some updates, I'm sure, through Instagram and Facebook as I'm working on it because I'll be hooking things up. And, of course, I'll bring those here to, to YouTube as well so you can uh, hopefully uh, have a good ending to this story. Bye, guys.